I'm the son of Tom and Jaina Ferguson, who started Gavin Cheese when I was literally a baby. Um, one of the first farmhouse cheese makers, along with Coulet and Doris and the Leans. And it was just, we've always been a family farm. Um, my dad is, uh, I'm the fifth generation on the farm. And my dad met my mom, who's a wonderful concoction <laughs> of English and Spanish and all these things. She grew up basically either in England or in Spain. Her Spanish side of things brought with it this sort of creativity of food. Um, she would have grown up with people making cheese and curing meats and doing things like that. And by meeting my father in West Cork, um, there was, I suppose, I grew up with two worlds of this thing of the very traditional Irish background and then this sort of continental thing where my mother would bring big flavors like curries and sort of have this kind of continental thing for yeah. things. And what happened really was that we've always been, I it was quite remote in West Cork. So I suppose we, by going to the city, you'd always find it easy to find things. We had small shops and small delis in West Cork, and it was always really wonderful, honest food when I was growing up. Uh, so if you really wanted to find the exotic, you probably had to make it yourself. And um, so I grew up on the farm. We had the cows. Uh, Mum started making the cheese in the counter. And I think West Cork, which has this fantastic thing of, of I suppose, and Cork in general, of, of the arts and food producers, I think the reason why a lot of it sort of grew up about 30 years ago and, and more was largely because, I suppose, people could take their products that they started to make and go and meet the shop owner and say, listen, this is what I'm making. We'll give it a go and try and sell it. And if it sells, I'll make some more and sell it again. And the thing is, is you didn't have hassocks and you didn't have sort of different things you could make it, sell it, it moved, it grew on, and it gave you a chance to start up. And I think that's probably a lot of the creativity would bounce on. So you'd sort of see a lot of other people helping other people in the area make food. And it was a wonderful period growing up in West Cork, just seeing these things happening and a passion towards food. And um, I suppose the cheese itself was, of course, the first product. And we, my mum could probably explain it better, but we have the, the logo, which is the hog and wheat sheaf, as we refer to it, which came from Eric Gill. And it was um, a present from him through my mother's side. And that was always, had, as has always been the backbone of our, of our logo. And we've had some pretty brutal and very, very simple budget sort of labels to go on things. Because in the end, the cheese ended up probably being taken out of the package and being put into a counter. But um, after making the cheese, uh, growing up with the cheese, um, when I finished school, I started doing the cured meats. And it was basically because we had pigs in the farm. And a gentleman called Chris Jepson was the guy who we would smoke, um, would smoke the cheese for us. And we could only get to his house at high tide or low tide, sorry, because the water cut off the beach. And we'd go up to his house, deliver the cheeses, and he always had a piece of bacon hanging off the roof, and he, he did all his own gardening, he caught his own fish in a boat he built himself, and then smoked in the smoker he made himself. He was a lovely guy. And he passed on his knowledge very slowly and subtly to me <laughs> on every trip I went out to him. So I'd take a bit of pork from one of the pigs from the farm, I cured it, and, and put it in the smoker, and then eventually he retired, and he built the smoker in Gabin to continue with the same flavor profile, which was referred to as the penny system. It's kind of a very traditional rustic way of smoking by actually smoldering logs in a kiln. And what happened is that this smoker was designed um, and built on the farm to actually tie in with this dairy, which was always from old recycled buildings from calf sheds and things to become what is going now. <coughs> and there's two chambers to it. Um, there's the, the cheese side, and then there was the smoker where the actual kiln itself was, and we'd hang the bacon and the hams and the salamis in there. And what happened was is that it was literally for our own personal use. And much like the cheese, we'd make one cheese, and then we'd give one to a friend, and that friend wanted some, and then another shop would buy it. And it would just, we've always grown very slowly. And we did things for fun, and it was never really about the business, but you know what? If somebody's going to buy it, why not kind of look at it, and we'd sort of convert another shed or another building into something. And... Um, <laughs> So my mum, which is the creative person, my dad, which is the doer, has always helped us as a family, my sisters and everything, basically create these different things. And if there's logic in it, it would just keep naturally going. So we did find ourselves with this range of products. And um, what happened was my mum was always very involved with slow food from the beginning. And um, what happened was that Dana met Lorenzo through slow food. And I'm going to leave the probably beginning story to yourself because 
I, I wouldn't tell it as well, but the, the basic principle was is that we had all we had really was the hog and wheat sheaf and a few little doodles and things like that. And the magic started to happen afterwards because we had these salamis, we had these things, we had the range, but what we didn't have was the glue pulling them together. And I think really that's where Lorenzo came in. He actually brought the connection. We were sitting around the table one day actually going on about how mad we were and about how unorganized we were and we had the cows and the milk and the cheese and the cheese as the way and the way we feed to the pigs and then we get the herbs from the garden and shall we make all that and then it goes to the market and you just one day he came back and he took our flyer or he created a flyer for us which I have in there and the concept sort of came from that this linear process and for many years, what was actually 10 years, we had the same website, which went sideways instead of down. It was the only time I'd ever seen it. It was a brilliant idea. And it more or less took this long process of our madness <laughs> and gave it a sort of a linear profile that actually helped us focus on what we did actually do. So I'm actually incredibly grateful to Lorenzo, and I'm going to let him do the rest of the talking from here. But that's... <laughs> <laughs> I know what that noise is, it's that projector that's keep focusing. I think it's the Velux Windows i one, it farts as well. Does it? No, yeah. wind, the wind makes it fart. Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, well, what else? I don't need to say anything else, it says it all, really. Um, yeah, so, let's uh, button. Uh, making the blue bean brand. Um, I picked that word making quite purposely, I didn't design it. I, we make it, and then I say we make it, he makes it, I make it, we all, Gabin and myself make it. And when I say make it, I very much mean that the product and the people involved in it are as much part of the brand as the design work that I do for them. Uh, it really starts off with the product. I think somebody asked before how important the product is. Very important. Um, if you have a good product, you can have a good brand. Sorry, my leg is shaking like this. Um, so it, it's something that I really want to focus on, first of all, before I start showing any work. I think probably most of you have seen some of it anyway. So before we design anything, uh, I usually insist on trying to get to know the people and the business as much as I possibly can. Try to find out what is it, who are you, what do you do, how do you do it, why are you doing it? And that's very important because that's obviously what we as designers need to reflect in the design work that we do. We need to reflect what you are and why you're doing this. So when it comes to Gubin, I mean, he calls it mad. Uh, <laughs> and it is sort of anarchy. I mean, it's, it's anarchy. It's, it's, it's a sort of, there's no linear thing. I mean, the leaflet that we actually did is probably about the most linear element that one could show that could be because the process that they go through is anything but um, so there's various individuals involved obviously there's Tom which looks after the farm and there's all the support and 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 I mean we could go on about it Gina that makes the cheese Tingo obviously makes the meat and Clovis herbs and vegetables now, but as well as that uh, Gina also has chickens and sheep Produces eggs, which gets sold in the markets. Fingal and Clovis are involved in catering. So there's always a sideline to what the main business that they have. And as well as that, <coughs> they also have sidelines which are may not necessarily be related to the business at all. Uh, Fingal makes knives, <coughs> kitchen knives, great ones. I have a few. Clovis is involved in making music. So they are, they're very creative people, they're very, very involved in a lot of different aspects. They all gel together, they all come together. Plus, of course, part of Gabin is where they sell the products too. Um, obviously, markets is probably the main thing that we started off with, the farmer's market. Shops, supermarkets, the phrase it is national and export as well. So they're kind of a, a rough picture of what could be really is and there's lots of aspects of green. So first of all they're passionate people like most of you would be. You're passionate about what you do. You have a passion. You have strong beliefs and that's all part of the things that we have to, to show in what we do. We have to communicate that. 
there's no point doing a brand that doesn't show what you actually produce in terms of quality and your beliefs. They're also creative individuals, of course. Um, to come up with new products, <coughs> you have to be a creative person. Uh, their creativity is expressed in lots of different ways. Also, we have to use up our seasonal things or come up with different... Yeah, it's you do. It's usually a need yeah. to make something sometimes. Yes. Uh, so that's part of the creativity as well. I mean, you, you have a certain thing that you have to do something with, so you come up with a product idea. It might take a week to produce, it might take a year or two years, or it doesn't get produced at all. And then there's the care. Um, actually, that's the wrong label, as it turns out. We just discussed that with everyone this morning. Oh, yes, Work done. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Um, the care. The care that goes into making things. The care that goes into making the products. Um, that's also part of the brand. You, have to, you also have to reflect that. There's a care for the environment. Everything they do has impact on the environment around them, but also the impact on all the people who actually eat the things. And hence the line on the label there, healthy land, healthy animals, healthy foods. That's very important to be. And then there's an integrity. I mean, there, there is integrity in doing that. Uh, there are certain things that will, they will not do. Just doesn't come into it, refuse. Innovation, we kind of come on to that already. Uh, they are constantly thinking of new things. It's not, there is, there is no plan as such. If there is a plan, I don't know it. <laughs> there is no plan as far as I know. Somebody comes up with an idea, it gets discussed. Um, it might be tried out. For the crack. For the crack. <laughs> as you said, that's, that's the way you started. We do something for the fun of it. And then it kind of develops into a product that might actually sell. And sometimes it doesn't. You know, we just had one recently that went on for two years or something. Uh, the, the fire? Oh, yeah, those things, yeah, two, yeah, yeah. two That's years true. didn't go anywhere. It's still sitting there. That doesn't mean that it might actually turn up again in a yeah. year's time or six months' time or, you know. And then there's obviously collaboration. The bean is all about collaboration. There's collaboration between those individuals within the bean, but there's also collaboration with people outside because there's other people that are involved in in doing things for them, like the uh, crackers, crackers the oat cakes, there's a baker up in the north, Ditties, Robert Ditty, yeah. That makes them for them. Uh, and there's other things like that. So, this is how Gubin actually works. Oh. This is how they produce the linear version. Okay, that's the, that's the cycle. Cows get around the grass, they get produced milk, the milk gets made to cheese, the whey goes into the pigs, the pigs get made into meat with the addition of herbs. This is actually how they come up with the products. Organized chaos. Utter organized <laughs> chaos. Which is very interesting because I'm, I have a Swiss background. <laughs> to me, the first time I saw that, it's like, Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, yeah, okay. That's interesting. How am I going to get, how am I going to make anything out of this? It is, you know, it's kind of difficult, really. But that's how it works. They it just con constant interaction. Um, I actually described their kitchen, the, the main kitchen, and the, the family home as their center. That's the, that's the headquarter, really, because that's where they gather every so often. They'd be having breakfast there, and Fingal comes in, oh, yeah, nah, nah. try this. You, know? you think, thinking of that, it might be interesting, you know? Or Clovis comes up with some idea, or somebody comes up with a problem, and gets this lost in trash that. So that's what they, how they do things. And that's the same linear production in the end, from grass to cattle to milk to cheese to, and, and, and so on. And that's where I fit in. <laughs> um, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm within. At this stage, I've been doing for so long, 10 years, I probably, I'm, I got used to how they work. It's great. Sometimes it still kind of goes, oh. But 
I'm, I'm on the side somehow, which is great. I want to keep it on the side. I don't want to be in the middle of it. That would be way too confusing. But the advantage for me of being here, as opposed to being here, is that I have an outside view of it. And that's very important. Because they are so involved in what they're doing. I need to have the view from outside of what they're doing so I can have an input as an outsider to say, well, actually, I think that maybe, or perhaps have you thought of. So that's a very important process for me as a designer to be involved in, in that particular way. <coughs> it's fascinating. Well, how they work is that to me is completely fascinating, most unlike any other client. Clients normally that I have come, specific product, brief, we do. The beam is completely different. So all about design, what do we actually do? That's what I said, we're basically visualizing what they actually do. But grounding to me is a visual expression of what they are, what they do, how they work. So, yeah, it could be 2000, I think we started, I'm not quite sure, I think it was 2002. The noughties. Yeah, no, I don't think it went actually that far, that, that far. I think it was 2000, 2002. Um, and it started off, as Fingal said, with Jane had contacted me because I had joined Slow Food and there was no Slow Food chapter in Kilkenny, so I was put on to the Slow Food Convivia in West Cork. No idea why, but she uh, found out that this Italian had joined, so she rang me up because of Slow Food. Uh, and I started doing work for Slow Food uh, as a national organisation at the time. And then once we did, I think they had a national event, I designed a few things, and once they did that, uh, she then came to me to do some design work for Gubin. And the first thing that we did was the cheese. Now, it was just a question of doing a label. The cheese was um, wrapped up, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't actually have a better name, you probably you might remember it. it. It used to be wrapped up in, in, a, car, in a wooden box, with a uh, very rough printing on it, a few stamps, mm -hmm. awards and things. And during the conversation she had this um, folder with various sketches and things in it, and this drawing. And she said, well that's actually an Eric Gill drawing. I thought, wow, Eric Gill, oh, okay. that's interesting, I wonder what the story behind that is. Sometimes she told me that was, yeah. Uh, and as soon as I saw it, I thought, well, that's it, my work is done, I don't need to do anything else. <laughs> there, there is no need for a logo. Why would I use anything else other than, than that? That is just perfect. It goes back, it's, it's in the family for, what, well, how long? I don't know. I swear, it still has the little lines he used to, yeah. to hand you the letters in the circle around it. Yeah, to be forever to clean those up. Anyway, but yeah. <laughs> it, it's a history, it's part of the family. It's a family history. We've been a big guy since the 70s, so we want to express, this, express a certain amount of tradition and you know all that kind of background that there is. So this, we decided, there and then, practically, to actually use that. Plus, we were talking about the cheese. I mean, perfect. You know, it's round. I, mean, I didn't charge him very much for this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> pretty, I was pretty easy going, really. <laughs> so that's it. That was it. I thought, well, that was, that was a simple joke. <laughs> all I did, literally, change the text, take all that text out, and replace it with more. With more, because it needed to have more information at the contact addresses, websites, and telephone numbers, and so on and so forth. So I just, I, I did all that. But, uh, and that was the very first job. After that, Jane came back and she wanted more cheese labels because she had uh, obviously the smoked version. And Fingal was doing the meats. That's where it started getting a little bit more involved. Uh, because suddenly from, from doing a label with a drawing that was the label, we had to adapt that to other forms of packaging, which was basically cards, they put onto the salamis and labels for the smoked meats and the bacon. 
so the, the drawing, instead of being the label, became really the Gubin mark. And the design work then was really involved in coming up with, with the rest, the color scheme and so on. Um, I had to design this in such a way, knowing what Gubin was like, and the chances that they would produce a product tomorrow or next week or next year that would be something completely different again. <laughs> It had to be flexible. It had to be something that could be adapted to all sorts of situations. So I basically just came up with this device, which is this uh, label. It was the stamp element as well, wasn't it? And, and the stamp, the, the, the symbol itself, the drawing became kind of from a stamp of approval or you know, the heritage part. From there, yeah, the colors as well. We had decided very early on that we wouldn't stick to one color uh, at all, that we would try to use different colors, make it colorful. Always flat colors, but we would try to use the color to maybe color code things or, you know, just make it a bit more lively. Oops, sorry. Come back. More cars, um, sausages, burgers. Actually, don't I don't think you're using them anymore, don't you? Are you still in the market? No, they they they've, 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 they've slipped away. Yeah, and the burger doesn't exist either. Uh, chorizo, salami, pepperoni. Pepperoni is a funny one because that's actually completely different. Typeface. It's not that at all. It's actually more kind of a rougher hand render because the market for that really you wanted to appeal to kids. We're also getting snacks. We can, yeah, we, it, it's snacks. sort of one of the more recent ones that we've actually done. We're starting to get braver, I think, weren't mm. we? Yeah. So we kind of just danced it up a little bit, used a few colors and different typefaces. Actually, it's quite dull. It's much brighter than that in reality. The cheeses um, kind of expanded then, the kind of different sizes. And the uh, gaudy one in the middle, aged, aged, washed, rind, would be trees a completely different color for. Also, some slight print problems because uh, some of the labels are not printed in the same colors, and we'll yeah, go into that. <laughs> the leaflet, the be Dave. And the next stage really was kind of adapt that adapting that thing then again to a point of sale things like these cards here. I think they just bend out. Ah. Oh, I didn't know they did that. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me while I'm talking to my client. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you learn something every day, don't you? I always come up with okay, okay boxes. Yeah. That's my big tin on the back of it. Yeah. Um, so I went to something labels, cards, point of sale, to boxes. So it's, it's the same graphic device used throughout all of them, but just adapted every, every, every single time. And it seems to work because we've been doing this for yeah, 10 years and these products come along um, every so often. You know, those oak cakes, take them out of the blue, I have no idea. But there's a few years into the whole relationship that they appear. There are the eggs. Yeah, yeah, so really bad for the rest. But we also needed generic items as well because of the randomness of things that would come yeah. and go. So that's why I love it. Well, that round label with the healthy land, healthy animal food, healthy animals, healthy food, that was kind of a generic label that, that we use on various other <coughs> products. And then there's things like the market stalls, backdrops. And again, you know, that one there is white with, with, with blue, but you can still recognize it as being Gabin, regardless of what color or positive, negative color, it doesn't matter, it's still 
recognizable. So what are the, the important things um, when it comes down to working with Gubin? Well, collaboration, as I said. The way we work, really, it's all by email. We, don't, we, meet, we meet maybe once a year. I haven't seen Fingal now for, well, more or less a year, actually. Yeah, we don't get off the far much. No. <laughs> um, but we collaborate constantly on, on emails. Um, and when they send me an email, I know pretty much what they're talking about most of the time. Sometimes I have to email back and say, what do you mean? But it's a pretty good, close working relationship. Very product range is one thing that you have to obviously consider all the time. Organic product development. When I say organic, not, not organic in the sense of no pesticides, no. Organic in the sense that it just grows out of their creative and, and passions and ideas, and vague ideas that get solidified into a, a product. So it, it, there's, no, there's no real plan, it's just, it just happens. It's and it's constant evolution. It, it never stops. We're sort of on the verge of another one, I think, which is the exciting yeah. thing now. We have a little bit of a reinvention coming up. And, and it, what I mean by that, I suppose, is that we've been very self-analyzing over the past few years. We've got to a point where, because this relationship now, he, he's, he's in our head, we're kind of in his in respects that I think we know um, what we want to do next to sort of tie things together, the folks that are working and, and the next stage. And I think that's something yeah. that we're all, yeah, we're always yeah. in a back and forth with each other on, so there will be another tweak. I mean, there's, there's things, you know, I spot things when I walk around shops and I see the Gubin things hanging in the shop, I see problems. Um, and I photograph them and I send them to things, so I actually, you know, the next time we're actually doing this, we need to tackle this because it's not actually working. We need to kind of and, and things like that. So it's that kind of work, working relationship that, that we have. I suggest things, they, they get feedback, they suggest things. They come. So it's a back and forth. And the same thing when I do design work for them, I send them, I send them roughs, which are probably more finished than just hand sketches. But they evolve. They're, they're, they're never really finished until they actually go to print. I uh, think that box there, well, I can't, I've, I've lost count how many versions we have of that. I mean, not not huge differences, but tweaking our things around, changing of wording, colors, maybe. The latest product that didn't actually go anywhere, we had 15 versions of it. Oh, we're just still looking for a, a baker. So yeah, they're still looking for a baker. I mean, that's, that, might, that might still happen, I hope, mm. because it's a good one. Mm. Uh, we just got stuck in the production end of things. Um, I think that the interesting thing is, is that there is basically origin, when you use up all your, la your labels, and you hmm. do have the ability to suddenly see an opportunity to tweak and change. You know, there is a chance of saying, Absolutely. we did it yesterday. Yeah, we did it yesterday with the phone. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's an, and simultaneous and multi-directional evolutions, and when they evolve, their product range it can go in any direction. It could be anything. For me, as a, as a designer, it's a non-linear working method, so there isn't really a start and a finish. There's only a start when I get the first phone call or email about something and it's only finished when it's actually delivered to the client. In between, anything can happen. It can go that way and then it goes this way because we have decided that actually it doesn't really... It's all good. I mean, it's all positive yeah. development. It's just there isn't a planning stage. There isn't some, a meeting that we sit down and say that this is what we're going to do. No, it doesn't happen that way for us. It's just it's constant back and forth. So design solutions need to be adaptable, and again, it's all about collaboration. I just I cannot emphasize that enough. It's collaboration. I don't work for them. You know, they're they're all my friends. We actually work together. We we make the brand together. This is if you remember that. This is what they who they are. Yeah. The other, it then out of all of that. Suddenly, I find out that Fingal makes knives. Someday, I went down to the, visit them and was sitting in the kitchen, and this knife came out. I was like, oh, that's really nice. Yeah, I made that. Oh, really? Did you? Can I have one? <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, I tell you. Yeah. The interesting thing was is that I didn't really have 
a maker's mark, as they call them. I didn't have a logo. I just came up with this concept. There's going to be an F back to back because I had this silly hmm. name, Fingal Ferguson. Fingal and Ferguson, and yeah. So yeah. why not do the two F thing? And I think one of the the points was that this, you know, every knife does need to kind of have something on it and, and play. But one of the interesting things is looking back is I gave Lorenzo this almost F, yeah, I a cross like yeah. kind of type thing that was all kinds of wrong. And I think it's the whole thing of stripping it all back and almost taking it back to the bare bones that you came up with the concept mm. that, that we have here that is still uh, one of the things I'm most incredibly connected with. I, yeah. I, it made it really as far as I'm concerned. Well, it's a great, I mean, those knives are fantastic. Um, he has a website that sells them if you want a good knife. <laughs> That's their the ones, they're great. Um, but those are the kind of side things that happen while I'm working on all the other stuff, every so often you know, something else pops up like that. And it's great fun. It's completely disconnected with the rest, but it's, it's absolutely fantastic working on projects like that. I think that's it. Yeah, there are all the different um, things that they're involved in. That's it. Thank you very much.